Recording in progress. For any reason we our technology fails us and we can't continue, all matters are continued until our February meeting. But we've managed now for two years to complete our business without technical problems. Um, I see we do have our newest member joined mm -hmm. us. Uh, uh, I don't know if the other board members know Nick. Uh, Nick Ligris was appointed by the selectmen to, as an associate member to fill the remaining term of Kathy Berardi's uh, term. Uh, he's a real estate lawyer, so we ought to bring a lot of good knowledge to our proceedings and, and welcome Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, thank you, John. Welcome. Thanks for having me. May I comment, Mr. Chair? Yes. So I, I, I sent a message to Mr. Ligris that as the new member, uh, we do have a politically incorrect uh, hazing, and he's supposed to bring donuts. And I didn't get my donut to my home. So Mr. Ligris, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. that, that's out there. When we get together, you have to bring donuts. Your PCP told me not to bring you any donuts, Mr. Tampkin. <laughs> if the health the health department's watching, that could be a problem. All right, the uh, building inspector. Sorry, I hello, gentlemen. Um, first order of business is to deal with the minutes of the last meeting. Unless there's a proposed amendment, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right, so uh, let me call the first matter, which is 646 Webster Street. Silva Development LLC applicant has applied for a special permit under sections 1.4.7.4, 3.5.2, and any other applicable sections of the bylaw to allow the demolition, extension, alteration, enlargement, and reconstruction of the lawful pre existing non conforming. family dwelling and garage located at 646 Webster Street and replace it with a new two-family dwelling with two new single-car detached garages. The property is located uh, in the single residence B district. Uh, we first heard this matter in November and as I recall there were two issues. One there were some gaps in the uh, time that this was used for two-family purposes which I'm sure Mr. Genta is going to address. He sent us a couple of affidavits. And secondly, there was a concern expressed by an abutting neighbor about whether the garages could be moved and whether they would harm the trees. But let's start with the uh, problem of whether this is a good two-family house. Mr. Genta. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and indeed, uh, at the last hearing, there was... There was a gap uh, for uh, really when the, the Lampadecchio family owned the property from, it was 1999 through 2017. And initially based on the available uh, occupancy records, it didn't really show much occupancy of, the, of one of the units. I had reached out to Mr. Lampadecchio and at that hearing I was able to verbally report uh, sort of the gist that, that the sons lived there and the other unit and family members used it, uh, but the board wanted more detail and some more substantiation with respect to that to show that there had not been an active discontinuance of the second unit. So it took a little bit because of the holidays, uh, but eventually I was able to meet with Mr. Lampadecchio and, and his counsel and uh, go through sort of the history, his use, his family's use and so on. And with that, he did provide an affidavit as to the use of the property during his period of ownership. So uh, you've probably all read it, but just to sort of summarize, basically in 1999, Mr. Lampadecchio's wife inherited the house from her, from her mother. So it was Mr. Lampadecchio's mother-in-law that owned the house. Uh, his mother-in-law lived there in one unit and rented out the other unit. Uh, and is, as indicated as affidavit, he was never aware of any unit, either of the rented unit being vacant for any substantial period of time. Once his wife uh, inherited, she actually inherited it with her two brothers. Uh, the two brothers wound up selling their interests to the Lampadecchios, so they then owned it outright. They proceeded to renovate the unit that had been uh, occupied by the mother, mother-in-law, 
and and moved in themselves into that unit for a couple of years they rented out the other unit and then when the tenants eventually moved out their son mario moved in he lived there on his own uh for a couple of years until i think it was 2005 and then he got married and moved out uh, while he was living there, uh, Mr. Lampedecchio indicated that basically, you know, he bought his own food, he did his own cooking, came and went as he pleased, essentially lived there like it was a separate apartment, uh, even though he was a related family member. When he moved out in 2005, his brother, um, Michael, moved in, and Michael lived there much the same way for a couple of years until 2007. 2007, Michael moved out, and at that point, Mario had been divorced. Mario moved back in, and he then lived there for several years until 2012. Uh, and then he got re he got remarried and moved out with his new wife, um, you know, leaving the the unit vacant when he left. Now, one of the interesting things is when he when Mario lived at the property both the first time, and then the second time, both instances, his then girlfriend fiance lived with him for a time, and then uh, ultimately moved out with him when he moved out. After Mario moved out, uh, the, the unit was unoccupied for a time, but then basically within a, a few to several months after that, uh, Mrs. Lampedecchio wound up getting very sick. She ultimately passed away in July of 2013. And towards the end of her illness, one of her brothers came from Ohio and occupied the unit with his wife for a period of about six weeks. Again, basically they lived there like it was an apartment, using it like it was an apartment while they were giving care to Mrs. Lampedecchio. She ultimately, as I said, passed away in July of 2013. They stayed for a little while longer and they eventually went home. Then for a period of uh, about two years, it looks like the, the unit was vacant. However, at least once, possibly more, uh, Mr. Lampe Lampedecchio did recall the family coming from Ohio, the entire family with the sons and the grandkids using the unit, again, like it was there in an apartment. They stayed there, bought their own food, cooked their own meals, took day trips, basically used it just like any, you know, like you would use a rental unit of an Airbnb or something like that. Uh, then in 2016, uh, Mr. Lampedecchio's cousin moved in and he lived there for several months while uh, with his wife, while his condominium unit was being renovated. And then he ultimately moved out. And shortly after he moved out in 2017, the property was sold. Uh, now, so I wanna circle back. One of, the, one of the important things is I did uh, specifically ask him, and obviously he didn't have a vested interest in this. Uh, was there any time when the unit was completely vacant for a consistent stretch of two years or more? And he was adamant that it was never vacant for two years. And in fact, that would be included that in the affidavit. Um, so, so, you know, on the record, because it was related parties that were using it, it doesn't show in the street lists, you know, in the sort of the registration lists and all that. It's not clear that they were using that unit. But, according, but based on Mr. Lampedecchio's uh, testimony in the affidavit, uh, that second unit was, in fact, occupied consistently throughout sufficient to avoid abandonment of the use. Uh, and, he, and although it didn't really come up uh, in detail at the last hearing, I also reached out to the most recent prior owner, uh, Susan ben Bendanza, who owned the property from 2017 until just recently when, when my client purchased the property. Uh, and she verified in an affidavit that, that she acquired it for the purpose of, of a rental property and that throughout the time when she owned it, she did in fact rent it out uh, both units as a rental. So, you know, it, it's not the cleanest uh, fact pattern, not the best fact pattern, but I think it does establish overall that there was not a discontinuance as the Needham bylaw uh, uses the term, there was not a discontinuance of the use. Uh, at the same time, I went and reviewed some of the other materials. And during the period of the Lampedecchio's ownership from 99 through 2017, there were a series of building permits um, in 99, 2001, uh, and, then, uh, and then an assessor's uh, update card in 2003, all of which consistently describe the property as a two family. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, and one of the things to note is with, with respect to the permits that were pulled, 
you know, those are permits that are pulled by in one case an electrician, one case a, a plumber, uh, one case a builder, you know, they all indicate that it was just two families. So we have third parties sort of looking at it uh, from the outside saying that, to, you know, as far as they were concerned, it was, it was used and occupied as a two family. Uh, so I think, so, so that I think covers the, the gap in occupancy to show that it was in fact occupied as a two family. Um, and, and then I think John, there was one other thing that was at the last hearing, the design that we had wasn't fully compliant, uh, with the requirements of the bylaw. And in fact, uh, building inspector Roach had, had made comments to that effect. We went back, we re revisited the design. And as a result, we changed the design uh, and you were uh, provided with those revised plans that now uh, we believe do comply with the uh, with the setback requirements and so on and all the dimensional and density requirements of the bylaw. All right, on the two family use, um, Mr. Tampkin, why don't you give us your, you have any questions? Um, it's a much stronger case than it was in November. Um, uh, it's a two year abandonment. Um, that the, the couple problem areas, um, the cousin is not named, mentioned, uh, who occupied it for some period of time in 16 and 17. Um, I, I, I don't think and I can understand the sort of turmoil the family was going through um, and the care of the former owner's wife and the family coming in um, and presumably an elderly person at the time not really focusing on rental income. But it's still, you know, from a preponderance of the evidence, I think you make it. Uh, but just slightly, I think it's, it's, uh, I, I don't, I don't see the third party attesting as to their presence on the site, the building permit, the plumbing permit in 99 and uh, what'd you say? 2001 doesn't show address the area in years that there looks like there could have been an abandonment 13 to 16. Um, and the Cessna's card in 2003 doesn't really do anything to push the scale. Um, so I, I think there's evidence of usage and non-abandonment. Uh, I don't think it's the strongest uh, case that I've uh, ever seen. A lot stronger than it was. That's right. Yeah, it, it was not a strong, it was a, it, you had Mr. Gold, yeah. Mr. Goldman, you have questions? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm convinced with this affidavit and the uh, follow-up by George and, and the, the repeat of the permits by independent contractors to show that uh, it was two family. I, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced by the evidence presented uh, under oath by, by a former owner saying that uh, while it may not have been rented, uh, they had different family members living there independently cooking uh, for interim periods of time, in some cases not paying rent. But I'm convinced that it was kept as a two family. Uh, and, and I do think there's enough evidence to convince me anyway, that it was not abandoned and it was a, an existing, um, legally existing non-conforming two family. Mr. Ligris, you wanna weigh in on this? You don't have to. I appreciate it, John. Uh, I don't have any of the materials from the beginning, so I don't think I'm capable of weighing in at this point in time. All right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm in the same place. I mean, the town has always assessed and taxed this as a two-family. It's always looked like a two-family. Um, I mean, I, I I think we shouldn't find abandonment unless it's pretty clear. And um, I think, as Mr. Tampkin said, the preponderance of the evidence is that there was always some use and never a two-year gap. So I, I'm, I'm okay finding it's a valid two-family. Um, George, I don't. I at least I didn't get the new plans. Yeah, I didn't either. Do you have them? You're muted. 
George sent the revisions in December and those were in your paper packets in December. Okay. Right, George? These are, uh, and okay. also they were sent, they were mailed to you. They were mailed okay. separately. Did you guys receive those? Those were, those were mailed well, on vacation. Daphne, I, I have an oversized plan dated September 24th, 21. Is that the one? It's like an eight by 14. Yes. George, what's the right date of the plan? Yeah, so so it's dated September 24th, 2021, and then it's got revision dates of October 19th, October 27th, and November 29th. Yes, I have that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so that, that's the revised um, plot plan, and if you have the, the building plans that match with that, then that's you have the revised plan. So what's the issue about it's too close in the back, or, or you've moved it? This is These are the detached garages, uh, George? Yeah, so, so the original issue was the first design that we had had a bump out on the side that was a it didn't go uh, it went basically all the way up from the first floor all the way up to the second floor and and was usable it wasn't just sort of a, a window kind of a bump out it was a full occupiable bump out that went as I said first floor and second floor and um, and because of the way the bylaw is written you can have a bump out in the setback area but you can't have you can have a bump out that's a bay window that's a sort of a you know more of a architectural mm -hmm. feature Definitely, or something yeah. that, right you know but you can't have occupiable you know two full stories of additional space in the in the setback area so we clarified that with the building inspector and uh, and i think there was one other issue that we uh, that we adjusted as well although it having now been um uh, you know nearly two months ago uh, off the top of my head i can't remember what the other issue was but it also had to do with the i believe with the setback um oh okay so what what about so the building inspector is satisfied with your revised plan well, what about the neighbor's concern about the trees in the back and the closeness of the garages yeah so um so there is some separation i mean right now the the existing garage is literally right on or just about on the line in that corner and we're pulling you know, we're pulling the garage at least five feet away so we're actually going to be creating some separation already uh and and um and so with that that right off the bat is going to take the structure further away from the tree and should have a beneficial effect so like if you look uh on this on the site plan or uh or plot plan there you can see in that back right corner the existing garage on the on the left the existing conditions it's right tucked right into that corner mm -hmm. And then you look to the on the right right side of the plan, you see the proposed condition, and you can see that 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 the garage is pulled forward uh, five feet. Oh, five feet, yeah. Line. And it's also a smaller garage too; it's about half the size. So, so we think that that addresses that that concern. But you know, if if it if the neighbor has further concerns and it's an issue, we can always slide that forward a few feet as well. You know, there is there is some room if necessary, but we think that the five feet there is is going to be sufficient to. Um, to keep it away guess, from the yeah, I guess the other part of it is is whether during the construction you're going to kill the roots of the trees. And the construction back in that area will be pretty minimal. You know, it's uh, I mean the garages aren't aren't that big. They're single car garages, and the in the garage in that corner, there's already an existing garage there. So to the extent that there is construction in that area, I I wouldn't expect it to have substantially more impact than the existing garage would already have. Okay, a poor foundation for the garage, George. Um, I'm not sure if they're gonna reuse the existing foundation to some degree, or if they're gonna, you know, pull that out and then repour. My, my, uh, I don't know if I know Leo's on the call. Leo, can you? Yes. Uh, hi, Le Leo da Silva. Um, yes, we will uh, uh, remove the existing foundation and be pouring two new foundations, uh, and those will be only a four foot foundations four to five feet foundation versus an eight foot digging like a normal house. So we're definitely not going to um, be in effect. And also this is going to be using as a small excavation machine, not going to need you know, to do this with a big excavation machine, but we can, uh, you know, we can look, look forward. And, and if we need, we, like George say, we can move this to, to the front a little bit to get away from from that. If we find out like when we dig in, uh, or we can move it now. That uh, 
you know, if you, whatever you guys prefer. John, is is the uh, the neighbor on the on the call here to respond? We do have we do have one hands raised. Do you want me to bring them in? Yes, Mr. please. Chair? Yes, please. Okay. The. Amy Willis has been promoted. Mm. Hi. Hi there. Amy and Ken Willis. Um, thank you. So if it was light out, we were saying if it was light out, we can show you that the house is right behind us. Um, so um, thank you for all the comments tonight. And we were actually wondering about the other garage that's on the other, the opposite side of the lot. Um, you know, we can see how the garage that's going to replace the garage that's already there is probably not too much of a concern, but the other one um, may be closer to a couple of the trees that are in the back of our lot, particularly one that's right behind our garage, which um, you know, is pretty much right in, right in front of it, at least on the plan. So is there a chance that that one could be uh, slid forward a little bit as well? So the garage on the left. Yeah, on the north side. Yep. <clears throat> so how far can you move it comfortably? We can certainly, I think there's room to slide it forward a couple of feet. Two to three feet? Yep. Well, I think, I think that would. And I think um, if we do that, we'll probably move neighbors concern. Them. You know, so that so that would move it to it would be like seven to eight feet off of the line. Yeah. All right. Seems reasonable. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate right, thank it. Thank you. Yeah, I, and I like what right. you were saying about using a smaller excavator. Right. If they can just be gentle if they, you know, find any roots. Yes. All right. There are any more questions? Is there anybody from the public else that wants to be heard on this? There are no more hands raised, John. Okay. If uh, there are no more questions, I'll entertain a motion from the board. Okay, may I make it? Sure. So move that the applicant's uh, request for special permits under section 147.4 and 35, 3.52, uh, be uh, allowed to allow the demolition, extension, alteration, and enlargement and reconstruction of the lawfully existing uh, non conforming two family dwelling uh, in garage at uh, 646 Webster Street and to replace that the structure with a new two family structure with two single family detached garages as set forth on the plan, but that the plan will be modified to move the uh, exterior garage on the north side forward by three feet uh, to protect the, 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 the trees. I'll second the motion. Uh, and before we vote on this, George, should, should we, do we want to move both of them forward? Uh, I think as Leo said, you'll probably move both of them. How do you want us to vote on this? Uh, Leo, are you comfortable committing to moving them both forward? Yes. There you go. So it's at the board's discretion then. Okay. So, so Howard, will you accept that amendment that both garages are going to be moved three feet forward? Uh, is it approximately three feet forward? Because it looks like the one on the the right side is is, is forward a little further. So I'd be, like to hear from the applicant uh, to move at his discretion two to three feet forward on the right garage. Yes. Okay, so uh, modify just, the, the, the motion accordingly. I would, uh, before I second it, I'd like a, a specific, uh, so there's no confusion for the plans and what we're approving. So if it's two feet, it's two feet, it's three feet, it's three feet, it's four feet. Um, maybe not less than three feet. Why don't we, I suggest that we say it'll be not less than eight feet off the lot line. 
uh, yeah. less than eight feet off the rear lot line. Sure. That works. So not less than eight feet so that the plan will be revised to move both uh, detached garages forward so that they'll be not less than eight feet off the rear property line. Okay. I'll second that revised motion. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Nice Good job work, putting George. this together. Thank you very much. You pulled another Thank rabbit you. out of there. Yes. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, it was thankful to a, a cooperative prior owner, which uh, I didn't think that was going to be the case at first, but uh, he was actually very nice, very cooperative. You have the soft touch, George. Hold back. George, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make you an attendee. All right. All right. So case number two, 1132 Highland Avenue. Needham ACE applicant is applied to the Board of Appeals for a special permit under sections 3.2.1, 5.1.1, 5.1.1.5, .1, and any other applicable sections of the zoning bylaw to establish an after school enrichment program for 25 students, kindergarten to fifth grade with two staff persons, and to waive strict adherence to parking and parking design requirements. Program will be in operation from September through June, 3 to 6 p.m. on regular school days and 12.30 to 6 p.m. on early release on Wednesday. Subject property is located at 1132 Highland Avenue in the single residence B district. And I note that this is the uh, Episcopal Church and they're going into the basement there. Um, who wants to speak on this? Please. Uh, Stephanie, can I go ahead? Yes. 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 Uh, this is Guan, and I have my colleagues Dennis and Hua here with me tonight. Uh, first, we would like to thank the board for giving us the opportunity, and also we appreciate all the comments that help us improve. And I would like, if you don't mind, can I go ahead and share my screen with you? Uh, I prepare a slideshow. It's easier to just show our plan. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, yes. Uh, Daphne, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen, Gloria. Great, thank you. Yes, so we are need them ace. <laughs> Um, we are an academic focused enrichment programs. Basically, we offer classes like language, math, so it's very academic focused. And we target, we provide services to elementary age students from kindergarten to fifth grade. And mainly, they are from the Niven public schools. And our plan is to enroll up to 25 students. And we will have two staff members on site the whole time. And we follow meet and public school <clears throat> calendar. That means uh, after dismissal time till six o'clock on regular school days, six to uh, three to six. And also need and public school has early release almost every other Wednesday. So on early release days, we operate from 12.30 to 6 p.m. And the location is uh, 1132 Highland App, uh, across straight from the Needham Public Library is the uh, Christ Episcopal Church. We're going to use the lower level, the hall and the uh, classrooms. And uh, for parking, the church owns the parking lot next to the Needham Public Library. Uh, so there are 20 spaces still uh, owned by the church. So we have the um, right to use those spaces in the parking lot. And based on the Needham regulations, we need to have seven parking spaces, two for the on-site staff and five for parent pickup. So this is our, uh, our own transportation plan. So at the school dismissal time, our staff will go to the Needham public elementary schools and pick up the students and the drivers will do live parking on the Rosemary Street. And one on-site staff will take the students to the program through the door on Rosemary Street. So there is no um, 
parking or stopping or live parking only for the driver, our driver drop out. And this is for the parent pickup. Our regular parent pickup time is from 5.30 to 6 o'clock. Uh, it happens sometimes the parents need to pick up their kids early. So before 5.30, and if you have the parking plot land in your packet, or I'm going to show you in the next slide, if one of the five parking spaces on Rosemary Street is available, parents can do live parking. They do not leave the car. They text our staff, and our staff will bring the students out. But if there's no space of those five marked spaces available on Rosemary Street, they have to follow the regular pickup schedule, the routine, which is for all parents go pick up their kids after 5.30 p.m. They can only park in the Needham Library parking lot. And we will stress that no parking on the Memorial Field, no parking on Highland Ave. And one day after they park to pick up their kids, they have to follow the sidewalk. We mark this on the map as well. They have to follow the sidewalk, take the crosswalk to the door on the Rosemary Street. And also when they go back to their car, they have to follow the same rule. And we have put this in our parent handbook. We emphasize that all parents have to follow all the traffic rules, parking rules, like traffic light, taking the crosswalk, and no running across the Highland Street, which is a busy street, we understand. So we emphasize this in the hand, parent handbook. One day in road, they will get a copy of the handbook. And also, for on the week before the program starts, we are going to offer an orientation for students and parents. And this will be part of the parent orientation. So this is the overall idea of the pickup plan. And here I'm showing you the map. Um, the building highlighted in the middle of this is the church and the door is on the side. So it would take a few steps to the Rosemary Street. And the, if you see the dash line, that marks the route for the parents. They come from the program door, they follow the route, cross the Highland, and go to the uh, Needham Library parking lot. And they can't just walk in the parking lot. They have to, if they go to the uh, farther end, they have to follow the sidewalk as well. And for live parking, like before 5.30, they can only park in one of the five spaces marked here. It's one, two, three, four, five next to the church. For all, all the other parking spaces, they are not supposed to park. And also no parking on the memorial field, which we didn't mark as available. So overall, this is the idea of the parking plan. Uh, I'm going to... Okay, can I ask a question about that for a second? Governor Green. Yes, sure. the, uh, the the plan is a little difficult to, to see the one I have in my hand and the one on the screen, but the five spaces, oh. is, are these spaces on Rosemary or are these mm -hmm. on private property? Uh, Rosemary Street. Actually, we checked with the engineering department. They are public available parking spaces. So are you going to, uh, how do you keep them open? If there's, imagine kids are going to school and other people may be competing for those spaces. How do you know that those spaces will be there? Oh, actually I did my personal survey. I go there every day between uh, three to 3.30, mm -hmm. which is our mainly job of time, our job of time. And every day for a week, um, there's only one car there. And I check the schedule of other programs, nearby programs, and their classes starts at four o'clock. So for us, there's no competition. And for parent pickup time, bottom of the line, if there's no space available, they have to use the, the library parking lot if they come before 5.30. But after 5.30, the Rosemary parking is off table. It's not an option for the parents to park. So, so I, 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 it wasn't 100% clear what you're saying. So in other words, the cars were pulling into spaces one through five on Rosemary, and then the teachers coming and coordinating with the teachers to, to, to uh, unload the, the, the kids and, 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 uh, yes. and that, that's what's happening? Yes, yes. The door to the program is right off the Rosemary Street. 
Do you don't have a marker that you can highlight? I see I see a black, and then I see what appears to be a door in the middle. Is that the door? Uh, if you follow the dash line, I'm sorry, I don't have a marker. Basically, the end of the dash line that leads to the building, that's the door. Yeah, I'm not clearly seeing dash line. Howard, but, but... Howard, it's it's the dash line is between space one and two on Rosemary oh, okay. Street. Yes, that helps. Oh, okay, okay, good. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so that that's the entrance between parking space one. Okay, so, okay, so the, the people are walking with the teachers and so on uh, into that door. Okay, and if there's not enough room, they're parking across the street at no. the library. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Daphne. Actually, I I have a question too. With yes. only two with only two staff members, um, it, it strikes me that the round trip there is going to be. It's, it's going to take a while with waiting for the red light and over to the parking lot. Is it really going to work with just two staff members taking the kids over to the uh, parking lot? Oh, the, um, let me correct this. You mean one we bring kids from the school and drop off at the, our program? No, I'm, I'm talking about when the parents are picking up. Oh, when the parents are picking up, it's parents up at uh, like before 5.30, the parents can stay in one of the five spaces. One uh, on-site mem uh, staff member will stay inside. The other staff member will bring one or two kids out to the parents' car. But after 5.30, the parents park in the library parking lot, and the parents are supposed to walk along the dash line all the way to the door of our program. So the member doesn't need to bring the kids outside of the building. Okay, I see. So, so after five thirty, the parents will park and come in and get the child. Yes, it's their duty to do that. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I, is this an existing use? Is this happening there now? Uh, the the it is uh not for rent now. The space we are renting is empty. It's not for okay. any. Okay. Yeah. But I, I thought, I thought there was another. Is, there was previously a daycare center there some point yes. in the past. Mm -hmm. That's right. Stephanie, you want me to uh, stop sharing the screen? Yes, please. I'm sorry, <laughs> this is quite... Oh, Thank you, Gloria. Okay, so anything more that uh, you'd like to say? I'd like to go through the comments that we have from people. Um, I think, yes, uh, basically we've covered the general information about our program. Overall, our goal is to provide a high quality program and to serve the community. Uh, we have done some preliminary survey, uh, especially the parents both work. They have the pressure to go back to office. I know not now, but soon. And they are in high demand of a high quality program. That's why we are here. We want to serve the community. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question before you get into comments? Sure. Uh, is there any record of when the former daycare center was in the church and when did that end? How long ago? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question for me? Do you, do you know when, do you know anything about the prior daycare center that was in there and uh, when I know it ended that operations? Yes, it used to be expressions, but I was not aware when the program ended. Okay, uh, I've been there. Uh, I just remember the kids on the football and, and cheerleader teams use that space for their team dinners and stuff. Oh, and, really? <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember those spaces always being filled. That's all I recall. And um, I'm not saying it's a huge issue, uh, but I just remember it, you know, around five o'clock, those spaces were always filled. I haven't been over there th during this pandemic for two years or so. Uh, just want to comment, but let's hear the, the comments from- uh, Yeah, but I've, I think the answer is if the spaces are filled, the parents will have to go across the street. Yes. And we we emphasize no parking on the memorial field because we consulted with some 
um, specialists and they believe pneumonia field is busy. So we take it off to make it simple. So just one room, go to the Needham Public Library parking lot. So, so I just only have one question. I realize yeah. it's a public building and it's a public lot and it's probably pretty empty during that time, I guess. But is there any concerns on their use or is there any need for a license or a lease or some type of letter or did I miss that? Well, it's, all, it's owned by the church and the church has given them, the, the church has leased, the church owns the parking lot across the, parking the street. Lot with, with the Christmas trees is all. That's right. Well, yes. and, and they lease 65 of the spaces mm -hmm. to the library. Got it. So it's the but church. they retain got 20. Got it. Yeah. So there's yeah. supposed to always be 20 spaces available for the church. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Understand. Okay. Thank you. So, so um, we have a letter from the church indicating that they're authorizing this use. The fire department had no problem. The police chief was concerned about no parking in Memorial Lot and whether um, there would be any parking on Highland Avenue and whether there would be congestion. Um, I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think that they've, they've answered my concerns. I, I would expect that we would explicitly ban any use of Memorial Park or parking on Highland Avenue and require them to proceed in according with their plan. But if they do, um, it seems to me it works. The building inspector, I think, had the same questions, and I think it's answered. The um, although he's here, if he wants to uh, say anything mm -hmm. more, uh, and the health department just points out if there's going to be any food, they need a food permit. Uh, no, we don't plan to serve food, especially under such circumstances. We don't plan to serve food. Uh, I don't know how you can keep little kids without feeding them. <laughs> mm. um, they bring their own snacks. Mm. Yes, that's the plan. They bring their own snacks and we will divide groups, like only small groups take the snack at one time. We want to limit the air <laughs> contamination. So, Mr. Roach, we have the pleasure of your company. Is there anything more that you want to say about this or are you satisfied? No, I, I'm satisfied. I think my my only concern, major concern, was that if they were using the parking lot across the street, that they absolutely need to use that crosswalk at the set of lights. They can't just cross Highland Ave and kind of cut the corner across there. And I think uh, I made that clear, and I think she understands that. Yes. And I think they would get killed if they did try. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that wouldn't go over well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just uh, raise an inquiry regarding the use under the table at 3.1, I believe, 3.21, that this is a school, uh, it's a, uh, a kindergarten or a school use, private school, it's a special permit, it's in the uh, single resident B district, so it's on a special, it's a use permitted by special permit, is correct. that correct? Correct. Okay. So I think it's a great idea. I, I like the presentation. I, I think there's a tremendous demand for uh, further education. And, and I like how you actually pick up the, the students at different schools. Uh, so I, I think it's a wonderful idea. Thank you. So Mr. T any other comments? Are we ready for motion? Mr. Tampkin, you wanna make the motion? They need a special permit. Oh, excuse me, I do have a question. Yes. Could, have you made an attempt to describe what parking design waivers we need to mm -hmm. make or i mean i can guess at them i mean there's no landscaping and uh, i'm not sure the setback is sufficient have you made any determination of that uh i'm not um i i don't think we have worked on that so i need to consult with someone to we're gone. So uh, well, we need to apply well, for the parking lot. Okay, but I, may, may, maybe I'll leave it to Mr. Tampkin's motion. Maybe we're willing to just waive whatever needs to be waived, given that this is an uh, existing parking lot. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, go ahead, John. So uh, I um, move that the applicant's uh, application for a special permit under the zoning bylaw uh, 
to establish a, an after school enrichment program for 25 students maximum, uh, kindergarten to age gr grade five, with a requirement with two staff per persons on site at all times. Um, and that the board waive strict adherence to all parking and parking design requirements specified under the code. Uh, that the hours of the operation, uh, I'm not going to limit, move to limit the months or days, but the hours would be from three to six on school days, on 1230 to six on early release days, whatever day that the week the school department chooses. Uh, do you need any more hours than that? I don't think so. I mean, I personally don't have a problem with you opening at noon or whatever hours you want during the day. Uh, I mean, you did your self parking study uh, rather than hiring an expensive parking consultant, uh, and we've accepted that. But if you want to, you know, suggest modified hours, we can do it now. Or if you want to come in to seek an amendment, you can always do that. So I'll just ask that in the context of my motion, I have three to six on school days, Monday through Friday, 1236 on the early release day. I'm not going to say it's Wednesday. It's whenever day is an early release day. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, the three o'clock on regular days and 1230, I believe those are the time, the earliest time the kids can get from school to our site. Okay. Without uh, playing hooky, John. Without playing hooky, John. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if the kindergarten and the fourth graders play hooky. I think they wait yeah. till six. But anyway, that's my motion. Uh, yeah, do I, we have a caveat yeah, regarding caveat. I'd like, like to restrictions? We explicitly prohibit parking on Memorial Field or Highland Avenue true, true. and add as a condition that they will proceed in accordance with the parking, the pickup plan that was described to us. Okay. And I, I would add into that, that they will enforce that parking uh, requirement and restrictions. So you're going to have to monitor that, that the parents don't park a Memorial parking lot or on Highland. And that I'm going to also add that parents and children use the crosswalk uh, to cross uh, Highland. And Highland Avenue, yes. So that'd be my motion, as amended. Mm -hmm. Second it, Howard? I second that, as amended. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Aye. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you when, so much. When do you hope to start operating? We're working on right after the February vacation week. Nice, nice. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Good night. Thank you, Devin. You're welcome. All right. So case number three is 32 Markley Road. Wes and Lawrence Soper, owners, have appealed the decision of the building inspector dated December 17, 2021, determining that a proposed addition and garage do not comply with the setback requirements of the zoning bylaw. The subject property is a corner lot located at 32 Markley Road in the single residence B district. I see we have Mrs. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Soper here, and who, who would like to speak to this? Yeah, I can I can um, get us started. So thanks for your time tonight. Um, my name is Lauren Soper. I am the owner, along with my husband Wes, at 32 Markley Road. Um, actually, a long time Needham resident. I grew up here. Uh, we moved back here four years ago exactly. Uh, we were pregnant with our second child at the time, uh, we needed you know, more space and I knew Needham would be an awesome place to raise a family. So um, we're here today, we've actually already started embarking upon um, the renovation of our, of our old uh, historic home. We have the permit in hand for the majority of the renovation. The only thing that is in limbo right now is just where we, we build the garage. Um, and so that's why we're here appealing the commissioner's decision related to how our rear yard is interpreted. Um, but I can provide a little bit of background and context as a way to start. Does that work? Well, you know, whatever you want to say, we do, we do have your plans. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, 
So, um, you know, we, we bought this, this historic home. It's, um, you know, built in 1903. It's got a ton of character. Um, it's a house that also needs a ton of work that kind of comes with the territory with that, um, which is fine with us. We, we love being stewards of this historic home and have enjoyed putting in the work to maintain it. Um, but over the years, I mean, we, we knew that there was going to have to be a serious renovation. So over the years, we've drawn up a number of plans with a team of architects and engineers and builders and designers to help resolve some of the big issues, which are we just we have a really narrow and dark kitchen. We have essentially no mudroom, only two full bathrooms. My husband and I actually sleep. Our bedroom is in a converted attic, so we're not on the same floor as our three small children, which we really don't like. Um, so, you know, we always put these plans together that would kind of somehow solve for this, but have a minimum disruption to the house. Um, and when we did these plans, we always incorporated a 10 foot rear setback. It's, you know, it's outlined in the bylaws that a property owner in single resident district B, um, you know, has that right. Um, we also, in our file, our 32 mark, we filed the building department. We were using as a guideline a survey that was done 15 years ago when the prior owners had done a renovation and right there it said, you know, clearly marked a rear setback. So we had these plans together. We, we honestly never really moved anything. Just um, we weren't really motivated um, to start spending money and disrupt our lives. And then uh, just a few months ago, we um, had a surprise of a lifetime when we found out that we were having twins. Um, it was very shocking. If this was in person, you'd, you'd see a big belly right now. Maybe that would make me a little bit more sympathetic. Um, but it brings our, our total children count to five. Wow. Which is crazy. Yes. Wow. <laughs> we, we feel the same way. So um, anyways, we pretty much decided like a week after we found out um, that we now were motivated to do this renovation. Um, we needed to somehow fit five children into this, this, uh, this modest 2,700 square foot home. So we jumped on the plan quickly. Our team was amazing. And even though they're so busy, they, they, prioritize our project and said, we'll get it started as soon as you get that permit. I went and met Dave just to front run um, the plans and just say, hey, here's what we want to do. We just want to make sure we can get going as quickly as we can. Everything looked good. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have the permit for the majority of the renovation. But when it came to the garage structure, you know, Dave said, oh, no, you know, you don't have a rear yard. You have two side yards. And you know, this, this was completely confusing to me. It was confusing to our entire team, everybody who'd been working on this project. None of us saw anything in the bylaws that even remotely spelled out that a corner lot doesn't have a rear setback. And not only that, we've been working on that old survey. So um, that all being said, we're here tonight to appeal the commissioner's decision that a corner lot in Needham does not have a rear setback. And it's nothing against the current commissioner. Hey, Dave, I see you're on. Um, I actually really enjoyed talking to Dave. He was great. He was really helpful. Um, you know, it, he, he actually um, was the one to suggest that in putting together our case for the ZBA to tell our surveyors to actually put in, um, in our plot plan, that old setback line to show that at one point our rear yard was in fact identified as, as a rear yard. And, and honestly, you know, I would say that that's the most compelling argument of this whole thing, right? The fact that there's two zoning enforcers who could read the exact same language, but have diametrically opposing interpretations. Because, I mean, I think that truly is how you define ambiguous. And when there's ambiguity in law, especially in property law, it, it favors the property owner. And in leading up to this hearing, I've reviewed a lot of case law, which is new to me. Um, I worked with a few Boston law libraries. I consulted with a few lawyers. So they sent me all this case law. And in the dozen or so case laws that I read, you know, there was not one single case that I reviewed where it says when there is ambiguity in the law that it would favor the government or the municipality. And that's because the government gets to draft language and gets to decide what to put in and what to keep out in those bylaws. And the person who gets that benefit is the petitioner or the property owner. So that's why we're here to ask the ZBA to overturn the commissioner's decision and to grant myself and my husband the rear yard setback that we believe we are entitled to. Thank you. Uh, since I, t I take it you're a lawyer or a law? No, I've just, no. I've just spent way too many hours 
like way yeah. too many hours on this, way, way too many. Uh, I mean, I was just going to ask you if you found any case law addressing this specific problem of whether corner lots have a rear setback. No, so um, that was something that I did ask the law libraries and the lawyers. There was one lawyer I worked with who actually has been um, drafting zoning bylaws for 32 years. I did ask them, do you know of any case law specific to corner lots? There, there were none. I mean, I can tell you when I was early in my days of researching this, if you just Google corner lots, rear setbacks, you'll see pages upon pages upon pages of different towns across Massachusetts, New Hampshire, California, Minnesota. I mean, I've read them all across the country. Um, and normally what you see, for instance, take Newton, for example, normally what you see is that corner lots are spelled out explicitly on how they're interpreted. They even have little drawings. Like if you go to Newton's um, zoning bylaws, they'll have a little drawing of a corner lot, right? And they'll say, here's a frontage, here's a frontage, this is the rear line, this is the sideline. So normally, well, I don't know normally, but at least of the ones that I've seen, it's just spelled out very clearly. And for whatever reason, our bylaws seem to be silent on the issue. Um, so well, at I, least, at least ambiguous. Well, yes, I, I, I mean, I, yes, I would say definitely ambiguous, right? That you can have prior commissioners interpreting it a different way. You know, that that is the definition of ambiguous. All right. So, Mr. Roach, could we hear your point of view on this? Well, cool. so, um, yeah, we did look at it and, you know, I've been with Needham now close to 10 years. I was with two other municipalities before I, I came to Needham. Uh, so I've been doing it for close to 25 years and have always interpreted corner lots to have two fronts, two sides with no rear. Um, if you were going to even identify a rear, it would be the point where the two sidelines meet in the back corner, but there is no line there, so to speak. Um, with, with that said, even with the addition that they had done 15 years ago, um, that determination of whether that was a rear line or a sideline or whatever really didn't have any relevance uh, to the issuance of that building permit because it, it met those setbacks by by quite a bit anyway. So even if it was determined whether it was a rear or a side at that point, it really wouldn't have uh, made any difference with the issuance of that permit. Now, um, you know, could it have been interpreted that way at, at one time in Needham? I, I'm not saying it couldn't have, um, but I'm just saying that that's not the way that I interpret it. And honestly, this is the, probably the first time I've been challenged on it. Dave, can you direct us to the code? What section would be helpful to us to look at that, that to, to indicate that a corner lot, in fact, has two front and two uh, side lot uh, setbacks and, and not a it's rear? A, it's the definition of frontage. I don't think it's going to help you a lot. But. Yeah, I'm looking at that. that. That didn't seem to address it. I, I saw that it was highlighted in the handouts. Well, the, the, there's there's a phrase that in the case of corner lots, the frontage is between the sidelines of such lots, which, which, you know, I, I think could be read to say corner lots have. Sides side and fronts. Of the yeah, I, I would just say to that, um, I, I understand they, they the talk about the sidelines, but si a sideline <sighs> does not mean side setback. A sideline can mean a whole number of things. A sideline is really just talking about what an outer boundary is. It's just saying this is an outer boundary line. So I, I, I know, you know Dave and I talked about this extensively. I know that's the language he was going off of, but again, I mean, it's, it's it's very ambiguous. I don't think that you can interpret sideline meeting side setback. And I mean, the zoning bylaws are, I think, 272 pages long. I mean, there's ample opportunity to spell out how corner corner lots should be treated differently. And it should be spelled out, you know, as I mentioned, right, like Dover and Newton, these other towns that I just pulled up. I mean, it's it's normally very explicit on what you're doing with the corner lot. I do agree because it, when the, the the reference for why there are no uh, rear setbacks is the definition, and I, I find that anything but clear. Um, 
Dave, I know we, years ago we had a, another case of corn a lot, and there's issues that came up. I don't recall the details, but is there anything else that 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 that, that, that leads you to believe that that there should not be a rear setback at 10 feet, but instead of 14 foot side yard setback? It's you know it it's strictly my interpretation of the of the uh, corn a lot. Um, it could it be spelled out more clearly than that? Absolutely. Um, we've looked at other towns. I've mentioned it to Lee Newman to bring it to the planning board and just put a clarification in there. It's kind of one of these things where it's not challenged almost at all. So we kind of like if it's not challenged, why why do we need to fix it? But she brings up a she brings up a great point, and um, I, I can't argue with the fact that it doesn't spell it out super clearly. I mean, by the way, the planning board does agree with the building commissioner's interpretation, according so to the letter. Let me let me pop in here. So um, my experience in the town and I live on a corner lot. And we had a rear lot. And it was very clear. And I'm looking at it and I sort of agree with Lauren on the definition of sideline is not side setback. So I, I guess the question is, what's the material negative impact by interpreting this as you got two sides, a front and a rear? Uh, what is, why would that be a problem for, for this case or any case in the town? I mean. Is that to Dave? Or do you, it's a rhetorical I, question to anybody okay. who's interested in answering. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I would just, uh, sorry, Dave, were you going to say something? Yeah, so it, honestly, it's a four foot difference in, in the setback. Um, because if we look at it, we look at it as a side setback, it would be 14 feet. And if we look at it as a rear setback, it would be 10. So you're four feet closer to the, to the, the property line or the neighbor. That's, that's the, the, you know that's that's the biggest fact right here and if and if it was a rear and anywhere else it would be 10 feet and they um, would have right depending if it didn't if it didn't um trigger new construction so new construction is a different animal if you're putting on something that's not let's say more than 50 percent of what's already there then you, then you can go to the 10 feet is there any way and, 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 and to sort of meet the new construction requirements and stepping it to 12 rather than 10? Or is that impossible on your plans? Our plans? Uh, well, no, I mean, well, our well, wait, wait a I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think this is new construction. No, 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 oh, I, no, not. no, I know, I know it isn't. I'm just asking the question. No, I mean, we're, we're doing a very modest addition. I think it adds. So it's 14 or bust. You can't do it without 14. Well, that's with the bylaw. If, if, it, if, if it, it's, if it's a side, it's 14. If it's a rear, it's 10. So you can't do it without 10. No, I mean, we like those 10 feet it's very sure. important and that's part of why i had our architect join as well but so our our detached garage is five and a few inches from our property line in order to expand the kitchen and the mudroom as much as we needed to the house was going to be within seven feet of our detached garage which obviously is under the 10 feet so we had to make the expensive decision to knock down the garage we're, we're moving the garage five and a half feet or six feet away from the property line if our rear setback is honored. So it's moving away already from our, our, our rear setback. And by getting those four extra feet, we're, we're pretty much taking that entire extra four feet, not to make the garage bigger. It's actually going to be a fairly small two guard garage, going to be 19 feet. We're pretty much taking all of that to create this, this, this little breezeway connector um, to really minimize the, the heaviness of the garage being connected to the house. Again, as I mentioned, we really value um, the historic nature of this house. And we don't believe that having a garage slammed up right against the house keeps with that. And so that's 
part of why we kept that breezeway. I don't know, Susan, if you wanted to comment on that. It was her great design. Yeah. Um, can I can I just jump well, on really well, quick? Be, before, before you do that, I mean, it seems to me there are two ways you could comply with the 14 feet. One is the one you just described, which is attach the garage to the house. The other is to move the garage backward further. And even maybe put it back so it jogs, if it needs to be large, that it jogs in behind the house. Yeah, I mean, I guess that we would, could do that. I, I yeah. personally do not want to take up my backyard for the garage. I mean, we'd have to move it back, I think. And we did look at that. We'd have to move it back like 25 feet or something, and we have no backyard. We're gonna have five kids. We we want a big backyard. Mm -hmm. We could slam the house, you know, the garage up against the house. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a great look. Um, we yeah. lose pretty much all of our southern facing windows, and it, uh, the mm. breezeway. And Susan, sorry, let, why don't you comment on the on the on the historic nature of the design put together? Yeah, I think one of the things about um, houses like this one is that um, you know they they kind they kind of have a very special character to them. And when you're putting an addition on them, um, you want to keep it consistent and keep it in the same nature that it was before. And a lot of times um, when you're restricted by things like setbacks and they have to make odd adjustments, it kind of takes away from the character of these homes and like for an extra four feet you would have this very historical looking garage and then a little bit of relief between the garage and the house so it doesn't look like oh they had to smack that right against the house it just it like sort of like takes away from the entire character of the house which if you take a look at it has you know um you know there's all kinds of like little pieces and nooks and stuff and it would it would just like it would keep everything looking like almost like it was always there. If you push it up against the house, it's kind of like, okay, they had to stick an addition on there. So um, mm -hmm. I just think because that house is what it is, um, I think it's important to preserve the whole look. And for four, I don't think it's asking much for four extra feet to keep it, um, you know, looking early so, 1900s. So, so, so that's not the point of my question. It was really whether there could be a modification and get your addition and uh, be happy with your family in this place. But uh, obviously you're shaking your head because it's, it's not whether it's, it's significant or not. It's our interpretation of whether the building inspector's reading is correct and we upheld that. So we have to reverse the building inspector's interpretation, which we're reluctant to do many times. So that's really the issue is to just understand so everybody when they're making their decision of what the impact or not impacted is. It's it's really not just simply a, a, a variance or something like a special permit where you have discretion. It's either up or down, really. I was just trying to inquire about yeah, yeah. it. By the way, I should just mention, I spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out if we could issue a special permit. And the problem is, is that the garages that exist, if it were the garages that exist were non-conforming, then under 1.4.6, we could let them make something that was less non-conforming. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that the garage is actually conforming. It's more than 10 feet from the house. So it's an accessory building. So the only requirement is that it be five feet. So the existing garage is conforming and not non-conforming. So um, that was John. Bad. Actually, can, can you can you just re repeat that? Because I was thinking the same thing that the the new the proposed garage the, is the the existing attached away. garage is a conforming building. And that's because even though it's so close to the lot line, is only five feet. Pardon me. Even though it's it's much closer to the the lot line. Uh, the requirement for an accessory building, which a garage is an accessory building, is only five feet. So it's conforming. But if we're, I understood, I understood that, that under the definition of accessory uh, dwelling, that it conforms. And, and, and the problem is, is that their new one is closer than 10 feet. 
so it's deemed to be part of the building and not an accessory. But but I'm just somewhat moved by the fact that that while we were attaching it to the house, it is further away from the rear lot line, which is creating the, the nonconformity. I wonder if it is, but so I know, so that the, the irony to me is it's you're moving it further away from the lot line, uh, and it's creating this nonconformity. The you know, trouble just is that they're moving it closer to the house so that they lose the ten feet separation. Hmm. So you're, you're feeling that the that the discretion the board has under seven five for special permits it doesn't apply. I spent hours, I mean, mm -hmm. trying to figure out uh, if there were a provision. There's some. I went through some footnotes. Mm -hmm. There's a, a footnote to the dimensional section that says if it were currently non-conforming. Mm -hmm. then it could be 10 feet when they rebuild. The problem is, is that it is currently conforming. conforming. Mm -hmm. Right, but I guess I guess just to get back to the matter at hand is we're just simply asking that our 10 foot rear setback be honored, which would allow well, us no, to- no, 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 that's not what you're asking. You're asking us to make a ruling that forever from now on, we're going to do it different than what the building inspector and the planning board say is the way we ought to apply the bylaw. Well, okay, I guess, but again, we, we've had a building commissioner, the prior building commissioner, and what I've heard is several prior building commissioners. Well, I don't think that's at all clear because well, the, it, but the it, survey it, it's, that not, I... it's not clear because it was only a five foot setback required. When you the, was I know, but on the built. survey, on the survey, so a surveyor well, but, puts in on their survey how a town. Well, that's, that, that's what the surveyor thought. That doesn't demonstrate that that's what the building commission thought. Well, the the surveyor is doing what the town believes. No, the surveyor is doing what the surveyor thinks the rules are, but that doesn't mean that the town agreed that's what the rules are. Okay. I, well, I guess what I heard at least in the beginning of this is that several people commented that the law or that that bylaw is ambiguous. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. Jonathan even mentioned that he's on a corner lot and he's had his rear setback be identified as a rear setback. So I think we can all agree that there have been times when a rear setback has been identified for a corner lot and that the language in this bylaw under front under a definition for frontage where it talks about sidelines doesn't mean a sideline equals side setback nor does it mean that it's defining rear setback or not rear setback so, so, so if you would, if you stop there that's where the issue is and i agree with you on both those points that it's ambiguous that historically this town has treated certain corner lots with rear with a rear setback and I agree with your interpretation that that doesn't say side setback. So I think the issue really before us, it, 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 it's very confusing, but it's very clear. We either agree or disagree. And um, all the other issues really are to understand the impact to you guys and then also the impact to the town because it has a, a significant impact. It's not just to your property, it's to all properties. And anybody who lives on a corner lot will have that interpretation to rely upon. And so it is more significant to that. And, and, and when the ZBA is asked to rule on an appeal of the building inspector's determination, supported by the planning board, it's a significant decision for us to make. Uh, but th that, that's really the focus, those three issues. You either agree that the corner lot does does not have a rear uh, or, it, or, or, it, or it can or it does. Um, so I, I guess that uh, I'd just like to hear the building inspectors. Any other thoughts on? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like to hear the building inspector tell us what harm would come from having a rear setback interpretation yes yeah, that's, that's what i wanted to know i mean they're not getting on a corner lot you're you're already um 
you have two sides that have significant setbacks. Like, why would a corner lot not get relief on like one of those sides? So they have a 14 foot setback and at least a 10 foot setback that could be considered the backyard. Right, so, so corner lots, <clears throat> unless they're a good sized corner lot, do, do have restrictions and most builders will shy away from corner lots, honestly, if they're gonna build a new house because um, we've got front setbacks on corner lots that affect um, garage setbacks as well, which are increased to 25 feet from from each front. So you're, you're handicapped there. And then being two sides, you also have a bylaw that says that it has to be 14 feet. And then after 32 feet, it has to jog an additional 16 feet. You don't have that on the rear. So corner lots, um, have a, a bunch of restrictions that a straight lot doesn't. Now, I'll, I'll give you a fine example of this lot here. Um, let's say she sold it tomorrow and the determination was that that was a real lot line because her house faces a certain direction. The builder comes in and he knocks the house down. He wants to turn the house the other way. So you telling me now the real lot line changes from one to the other because of the way the house is facing? That's that's what was determined before how they established the rear lot line. So it it muddies the water a little bit by doing that. Um, and then not that it makes a lot of difference, but on a sideline where you had two lots abutting each other, you'd either have a 12 or a 14 foot setback. And in this case here, if you determine one side of it as a rear lot line at 10 feet. And then the other one at 12 feet, it's it's two feet, or in some cases four feet closer to the lot line than than it would be if you determine it as a sideline. So, you know, we looked at all these zoning changes a few years ago, and um, you know, in this in side setbacks in particular, and the biggest the biggest issue with people were the size of the massing of the houses so close to the lot lines, and the 10 foot setback, you know, was was in effect um, prior to 1986. And in this case here, um, unfortunately, if the garage was attached to the house, you could have fallen back on, you know, a section of the bylaw that allows you to extend to the 10 feet, as long as you don't, as long as the previous um, primary structure was already there. That doesn't help you because this is a obviously a freestanding garage but um you know i think we're definitely going to look to to clean up the language to make it absolutely crystal clear but again honestly i've, I've i issue almost two thousand permits a year and this is the first time that this has really come up as a challenge so so dan let me ask you a question if you were proposing changes to the zoning bylaw to make it clear, would you keep the same substance in the bylaw that there would be two sides and one rear or no rear, excuse me? Correct. Yeah, we, we actually already have language that we're looking at. It just, we don't, you don't, you don't create your own, your own language. You basically steal it from another town. So we've looked at a couple other bylaws. <laughs> And we're going to adopt, adopt that probably. Lauren, what if you what if you make the garage more narrow and longer so you comply with the fourteen foot setback? Is would two cars not fit next to each other? No, I mean two cars aren't going to fit now anyways. It's not. I think we have it at nineteen feet. Um, and I I I don't I don't want to lose more of our backyard. I mean we're going to have five kids. I want them to have a backyard. That's part of why we bought the house we bought. No, 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 I, I appreciate that. So what I'm just saying, just trying to, to put all this together to get to to get to a, a successful plan, that is if you make your the garage thinner, uh, it would comply. It's not taking up more space. I, I'm just suggesting if you make it longer, you'll have more storage space, uh, maybe two feet. It doesn't seem to be a material modification to the backyard. Um, we, I mean, if we made the the garage narrower than 19 feet, it would essentially be a, a 
an oversized one car garage. So mm -hmm. I I don't think that. So 19 happen. feet. Can you can you fit two cars next to each other? What's the average? Not, Eight, not nine really. feet. Not really. I don't. I I, I mean mm -hmm. that's a, that's considered a, a very small. Uh, two right. So in other words, if it doesn't work now garages. for two two garages, if it doesn't work now for two. If you just thin it, so it's really more of a one, but you're making it slightly longer, you'll have more storage. And this way you get the approvals that you're seeking by modifying this a little bit. I, I like the design that we've come up with. I think it looks mm -hmm. right with the house. Um, I think that we need that space um, as it is. Um, and I know, I know we're kind of going in circles here, but I guess we all are in agreement that this is ambiguous. And, you know, like I mentioned, of all the case law I've read, and whenever there's ambiguity in law, it it it, it goes in favor of the petitioner. And I, and I mean, I, I've heard from now a number of you where you've all said, this is ambiguous. Jonathan even said, I have a corner lot and it's been identified as a rear. I mean, I, aren't we in agreement that this is ambiguous and that we should follow the case law that we've seen and that when there's I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think the ambiguity means that you have your argument. And it doesn't mean you're successful. It means there's an ambiguity and we have to in, perhaps <laughs> interpret it. Doesn't mean it falls on your side. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a rear uh, setback. Um, and you know. Anyway, I think we've gone round and round, okay. and I think. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to add to the discussion that we had two comments from two neighbors who supported this, and today we received a comment from the neighbor who is closest to the garage, who is unhappy with it being ten feet and would like it fourteen. There is one hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and promote. Yes, please do. Right, Anthony, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, just a question. Um, uh, sure, yeah. What's above the garage? What is proposed to be built above the garage? Um, I I don't we don't know yet. Um, we're just kind of keeping that open. We figured it would be great for storage. Maybe it becomes an office, maybe it becomes a bedroom, or I don't know. We're just keeping the options open at this point. And it's not connected to the proposed rest of the well, I mean, it's connected through the breezeway. I understand, but on the upper level, it's not as if it's- Oh, no, 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 no. It's not connected. Proposed living area, okay. And, and, and even if it wasn't physically connected by the breezeway, the bylaw says if it's less than 10 feet, then it's all considered part, one yeah. main building. Right. Um, one other question. I know that there, Mr. Roach suggested some proposed changes. Is that- something that's being actively considered at this point in time um, for clarity, Mr. Roach, or? Um, yes, it is. I've, I've talked to the town planner about it and um, yeah, we're gonna put that in there. Well, okay. I, I, I can tell you, I was on the committee and there was a real movement to significantly increase the rear setback that ended up um, falling off also, so. Who knows what we'll get when they go through the zoning process? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. After you said there's somebody else in the public that'd like to be heard. I promoted. I promoted. Um, Hi. Promoted. Oh, oh there he is. Thank you. Yeah. I, I know you guys have been working hard, and it's been a long night. But uh, I just I'm the adjoining neighbor on the side uh, where the setback is in discussion. So I just want to present my personal view as uh, a side neighbor, because from our perspective, they're a side neighbor, right? We have a side neighbor on both sides, so they might argue between sides and and rears, and obviously that's up to the lawyers to determine, but from our sole perspective, um, it's a side property for us. So building those four feet closer would feel like it's encroaching um, kind of our sense of density and, and privacy especially since they were going um, a little bit higher up on the structure. Yeah, from I, we submitted a letter with some pictures from the inside of our house. And again, from, from that side of our house looking out, that garage edifice is like the primary view of our property from the kitchen, 
dining room and front room. That's all we see. And going higher would kind of obviously mm -hmm. uh, take away our view and make it feel like uh, we're in a more, more denser uh, town. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it would feel very uh, close and overpowering for that size of structure going uh, up to a two story. Um, again, we, we moved to Needham. We love Needham suburban feel, and we feel like this larger structure built closer would kind of hamper that feel. So we kind of agree with the uh, zoning board's interpretation that there's two frontages and, and two sides, because that's how it feels as a neighboring side neighbor from our perspective. So that's, that's, that's all I wanted to add. Um, thank you for your consideration and time. What address do you live at? Uh, 26 Alfredton. So we're right where the kind of, um, again, we're, we're the mostly, most closely affected neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's right where the, the appeal is, is being considered. Thank you. Yeah, and if I can just comment on that, um, you know, I, I understand when they bought their house, um, our garage is where it is, right? So that view is, is what, you know, they knew was there when they bought it. So the garage is actually, if our rear setback is honored, is going to move five and a half feet farther away from their house. So the view is going to be the same. Actually, it's going to be less dense and it's going to be a new structure. Right now, the garage is, I don't know, 60 years old. Um, it's it's not two stories. It's one and a half stories. Um, it's We measured it. It's going to be four feet taller than the current structure. It's going to be one foot smaller um and if this is not granted the only other options that we've discussed is because we have a smaller garage we'd probably go two stories on the garage using a side setback so it would actually be bigger um so i i, I guess i'm you know i i i think i get it i know they mentioned too like oh we've, we've seen all these knockdowns uh, their their kitchen and their their family room face this um this this house that was built over like 18 months this new construction uh it used to be like this little one story 1100 square foot cape that's now a two and a half story 4000 square foot house which i actually think is quite lovely but i get it right um but i would not compare that with what we're doing we're literally going to move the garage away from their house five and a half feet and it's only going to be about four feet taller, um, and it's actually going to be one foot smaller. All right. Any more? Any more questions? We have another hand raised. I will promote that person. It's an Alex W. Hey, um, my name is Alex Weiss. I'm uh, also a neighbor, uh, not exactly next door, but about three houses down at 12 Mark Lee Road. Um, you know, legal arguments aside, I'm, uh, you know, I've seen their plans for a while now um, and talked about it with them extensively. And obviously, you know, just have an interest in the neighborhood in general uh, and the street itself. Um, and, you know, I'm certainly very supportive of what I've seen from them. These guys are, you know, great neighbors, great community members. And uh, for what it's worth, I'm, I, uh, you know, I have no issues with what, what I've seen proposed and uh, would, would love to see it happen. That's all. Could I have your name Thank and address, please? Sure. Alex Weiss. And I live at 12 Mark Lee Road. So just uh, three houses down. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Sure. Oh, Anybody we have else? another. We have another um, hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and promote them as panelists. Oh, I was on mute. Everyone's heard that before, right? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Could we please have your name and address? Hi, sure. Um, my name is Katie Davis. Um, I live over um, on 58 Warren Street. Um, and I just wanted to just interject and say a few words. Um, 
I'm a lifelong Needham resident um, and also um, like the Sopers live in a historical home um, over in the center of town. Um, and I like to think that I have a vested interest in people who take the approach to renovate and invest, you know, the time and the resources to um, kind of reinvent their historical homes instead of, you know, going and, and taking them down, um, which I think we see a lot of um, going on these days in Needham. Um, so I really appreciate the efforts that the Sopers are taking to kind of restore and maintain um, such an awesome historical property. Um, so I just wanted to say that I support what the Sopers are proposing and you know, hope that you guys approve their appeal. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Gentlemen, is it decision time? I think so. Mm -hmm. So we won't, we won't, we won't make uh, Mr. Ligris Normally what we do is we make the newest member of the board go first, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's really fair since this is your uh, first hearing. So why don't we let Mr. Goldman go first? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I appreciate the presentation. You've made a powerful presentation. Uh, uh, and I appreciate that it's a historical home to be renovated and uh, that uh, some neighbors have supported it, but also, so what the issue in front of me is that the, yes, I agree that the definition is ambiguous, but that the building inspector is unambiguous with his interpretation that's supported by the planning board. And in fact, there's a direct abutter who's impacted by it, who, you know, is concerned with the largesse from, from his perspective. So, uh, and John, the chairman pointed out that, you know, when I said in response that we're kind of moving it away uh, from the the lot line uh, by several feet, that's a positive, but he affirmed that under 1.46, and this is an accessory dwelling and is compliant uh, uh, under the statute. So it's it's not a non-conforming structure as it exists today, despite the irony. So that being said, as, as much as I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find ways, and I tried to engage with, with, with you, Lauren, to see whether we can modify the structure make it more narrow to eliminate this this setback and, and you felt that the the plan as presented should not be modified so I I think that 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 it's that that as a board member I have to support the interpretation uh in the 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 enforcement by the 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 planning board of that interpretation I don't think it's uh it's unfortunate it's unfortunate is, is how I'm coming up but but finding a diff difficult precedent, I wish I had, and maybe we can continue this. You mentioned you had some case law that while you spoke about generally uh, that was supportive, that in the case of an ambiguity and, and set of facts similar to this, that the homeowner would prevail. I, I would be anxious to see that case law. So perhaps uh, be, because of at least where I'm standing is uh, of, of not finding a way to approve this, perhaps we can you can postpone this, uh, which is your right to allow uh, uh, some case law to be presented that would be favorable to your interpretation. Just a suggestion, but thank you. And I appreciate your, your presentment. Mr. Tamkin. So I think this is probably the first time in my career, and I think I'm on this board for about 15 years, that the learned building commissioner and I disagree. Um, so uh, I'm not saying that um, the town meeting can't clarify this bylaw better and understand the impacts to a corner lot and how it can fit into the scheme of zoning. But I think of the three components, the ambiguity, what it says and what it doesn't say, say I'm actually inclined to uh, vote to uh, overrule your interpretation, uh, Mr. Roach. I don't think I've ever done it before, but I think it's clear to me that it's very unclear. And historically, at least in this town, in my experience, and it's not just this lot, uh, that there's a real lot. And um, I'm not saying there shouldn't be or should be. Um, I think that's up to the town meeting. But in this particular case, on these circumstances, 
I think the applicant has, uh, the appellant has made a, a, an argument that I'm willing to agree to and overrule the decision of the building inspector. Well, this doesn't happen very often. Um, I, I, I literally spent hours trying to figure out a way to make this happen. Um, you know, our basic philosophy is when someone wants to do something reasonable, we try to find a way to make it happen. And uh, I thought we were going to be able to do this by special permit, but now I see we can't. Um, I'm very reluctant to overrule the interpretation of the building inspector and the planning board. Um, I, I'm perfectly willing if the applicants want to continue the hearing for a month and give them a chance to see if they can come up with some kind of case law that would move us, but um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to support the interpretation, as I say, of the building commissioner and the planning board. So would you like us to put it to a vote or would you like to take a month and see if you can um, come up with some case law that would move us? Really can, give can, you I that just, option. can I just ask the chair a question since sure, this sure. really doesn't happen? Um, what is the requirement to over uh, rule the building inspector or a firm? It has to be unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think all decisions of the board except for comprehensive permits have to be unanimous to carry. So, um, I mean, would you like to take a month and see if you can come up with some case law that might move us or do you want us to end this tonight? Um, so when you say case law that will move you, um, can you just share with me what what would move you? I guess I'm not. I mean, I know I didn't. I didn't know how much time we were going to have, so I didn't go through all the case law I already had. What What would you be looking for? I guess. Um, some Some place where a court has interpreted, in the face of ambiguity, whether there are two sides or a side and a rear on a corner lot. I mean, I, I did the same thing you did as I try to Google it and all that really comes up that I could find were, you know, 10 bylaws from various towns that deal with it explicitly one way or another. But I mean, if, if there's some place that a court has said when the bylaw is ambiguous, then there ought to be a side and a rear that would move me. So it would, you would want it, it not, it's not about case law being ambiguous about just bylaws in general well, that, that, that's or, that's that's there's one principle that when the when it's ambiguous but there's also another principle which is that the administrative authorities who interpret the bylaw you're supposed to give preference to their interpretation and we have here both the building inspector and the planning board the planning board writes the bylaw and the building inspector administers it coming up with an unambiguous view that there's no rear. Or, or there's another alternative. There's a, there's a continuance. There's a withdrawal of the application. And uh, or to vote. Right. Um, I'm just trying to think of Um, because if I, if we get denied today, then we could go, if we wanted to, we could go to land court and. Yes, you can. You can go to the land court or denied, the superior court. Yes. Yeah. Or you can go yeah, back we, and redesign your project. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to do that. I think, I think two years of design is, is enough. Yeah. I mean, we, we. We have, I mean, we've I could show you our brains all every which 16 way. versions of this design, so we just can't. Um, so, okay, so if we get denied today, we can get started on going to land court, or we delay it a month 
and work to find more specific case law that is specific to corner lot interpretation. That's, is that, am I yes. just, I want to make yes. yes. Um, all right. Or, uh, or, or withdraw it perhaps without prejudice, which will not prevent you from filing at some other later date. Um, so, and go back to square one. And no, I mean, you know, um, I don't think that's what we want to do. Uh, I guess <laughs> having to make a decision on the fly, which I don't like, it's not how I roll, but I guess West. I don't know. I think we want to maybe continue this since we could. Yeah. We could, um, I mean, it's one more month. Sure. And we, we just, we, we work more closely with those lawyers that we had and see if we can find something that's specific to corner lots. I would have to think it exists somewhere. Um, we just, you know, in our, in our initial scratch on the surface, we just didn't. We didn't see that. Um, okay, so I guess, then, yeah, I guess then we want to, so we would continue this and that would be what the February meeting? Yeah, what's the February date, Daphne? And the February meeting is February 17th and we could make them the first item at 7.30 on Zoom at the same Zoom uh, ID number. So is that what you'd like to do? I mean, we're going to be in Disney World, so not really, but uh, I think this is important and we'll have to figure out how to do it. Um, so let's just let's just do it, I guess. You, Wes. you could you could continue it till the March hearing. Yeah, I know. I just I'm all right. Just let let I um you can also decide on the 17th to continue with it. Yeah, further. so let, let us, let us, yeah, let us, let us do that. It's just, it's too much to, to think about right now. Um, but let's, let's just plan on February 17th and we'll see what we can find. Okay. So okay. Can, I, can, I clarify, can I clarify what the, um, what the ramification is for, um, for uh jonathan was mentioning prejudice what, what does that look like if you withdrew your application with mm -hmm. the consent of the board that your withdrawal would would be without prejudice meaning you could file if, the, if the board agreed after a full yes. hearing yes you, you if it's withdrawn without prejudice then you can refile at any time if it's withdrawn with prejudice, you have to wait, I think, a year. Yeah, but, but, just to clarify, by withdrawing without prejudice, you come back six months with the same design, you're not going to get a different result unless the case case law is supportive. So I don't know what that would accomplish. More time to find <laughs> the right lawyer to present your right case or or decide to redesign your project well, and drop the application. You know, I mean, we'll... we'll, we'll... I, I don't think it would be appropriate after the length of this hearing to withdraw without prejudice. That's fine. And, and, and we'll give them as we'll give them we'll be liberal with continuances if they want to continue. Yeah, this no, I mean we we don't want to continue get legal this. advice I mean, or to make a legal case. Yeah, our our garage is, is, is literally getting knocked down tomorrow. So, uh, in the longer that we let this extend, you know, it's going to be impossible for us. So we have to make a decision one way or the other whether we beef up our case or we just say forget it um so you can yeah always we'll, build the you can always build the garage later too it's separate well, yeah i house. mean that's yeah that's the idea i mean we're gonna be without a garage for at least se several months um and then i just just to confirm the continuance we we would have to have a denial from the board to go to land court so we wouldn't yes. be able to okay yes so, but when you get to land court, they're going to be inquiring about the case law as well, I would right. think. Yep, I, I understand mm -hmm. that. Um, I mean, the attorneys that we consulted with had said that in the, in the land court, we would probably be fine. So, but I get it. I totally get it. So let us, let us, I think continuing is what probably makes the most sense. Um, and we'll have something by the 17th. Um, 
or at least we'll know if we need to continue it further because of our vacation plans. But yeah, this has gone on long enough. I know probably people are pretty tired, so I appreciate the time. Thank you. All right. So, um, however, you make a motion to continue until February. I move that the applicant's request for a special permit be continued to the February meeting, Feb 17. John, uh, I, I think it's a motion to uh, not a special permit, but to appeal the denial by the building inspector. I think that's the uh, thing. So I'll second that motion, though. All right. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll see you on the 17th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Roach, thank you for your participation. Susan? All right. Thanks for the support. All right. Nick, right, nice so to see you. Nice to see you in this context. Is there anything else we need to do tonight, Daphne? No, that's it. We'll see each, everybody in February. We have one case already uh, lined up, but we'll know on Monday all the cases that we're going to be having for February, right? All right, then we're adjourned. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Be well. Stay safe, everybody. All right. Thank you all.